Howdy, Pilgrims. This year's Kachi, a.k.a. Dolakaba, from the English language team of Russian Fishing Four, And I'm here at Quarry Lake. And I'm here today to talk to you about a couple of things. And primarily what we're going to talk about today is fishing rods. We are going to talk about the principles that work in the fishing rods in the game, how they affect performance, and a little bit about what kind of rod you should use for what kind of application because since this game is based very heavily in real fishing this is information that will help you not only here in the game but help you in the real world too without further ado let's head on over here to the tackle shop and we're gonna hit E we're gonna load her up and we're gonna go to the rods and we're gonna take a look at the rod entries If you ever pop open the store or one of the other interfaces and it's taking a little bit of time to load, you can always close it and reload it. All right, so what we're going to do, let's find us a likely rod here. I think we'll go to, oh, spinning rods, and we'll go to the Express Fishing Heavy. Here we go. When we open up the Express Fishing Heavy, of course, we got our picture over here, which, by the way, hold down your left click and move your mouse, and you can rotate that around. You can use your mouse wheel to zoom in and zoom out to get a better look at it. You're going to have a description of the rod over here, as well as up here have a circle with an eye in it that if you hover over it, it'll say parameters. You click that, and you'll get all your important information about your rod. Now, we're going to go through this one step at a time. I have set down and used my trusty rusty art skills to put together a little bit of artwork to help and let's get on this business well the first thing we're going to see here in parameters is it is the type of rod which is a spinning rod then we go on to sensitivity now sensitivity of a rod is not how easily its feelings are hurt but rather it is how well you can feel vibration in your hand through the rod because if we've got a line out there and we're bumping a jig across a rocky bottom every time that jig bangs into a rock out there it's sending a vibration up the string through the rod and into your hand now the more sensitive the rod is the more easily it transmits that vibration and the more easily you can feel it this is important if we have a very light biting species like some species of trout or small fish who might come up and take a peck at your at your bait or your lure ever so slightly if your rod has low sensitivity you're not going to feel that however if your rod has good sensitivity you're not only going to feel those light bites but you're going to be able to tell if you're bouncing your rod across a stone bottom or you're dragging your rod through a bunch of reeds or you're dragging your lure along a mucky bottom and in the game that is represented by our tension bar at the bottom of the screen when you're got a sensitive rod and you're bringing it in across the bottom and every once in a while you're getting little flashes of yellow down there it means you're probably bouncing across some rocks on the other hand if you get a pretty consistent amount of yellow well then either you're going through open water and it's the resistance of the lure or you're dragging through some muck all right now sensitivity is measured on a scale of one to ten of one of ten so this is a two of ten sensitivity meaning it's not a particularly sensitive rod okay next we have action well action is rated in speed extra fast fast moderate slow and extra slow now what the action is is a measure of how far along the length of a rod the rod bends and so if we take a look here at this graphic we can get a nice clear explanation now as you can see here we've got three fishing rods here that i have drawn up and you'll notice that we have a fast action a medium action and a slow action now well there are certainly extra fast and extra slow and stuff we're going to go with these three to keep it simple now what i want you to note is how from the tip of the rod to the red line that goes up and down on each example we've got the rod bending well a fast action rod you'll see is about the last fourth of the rod 
that a medium action rod bends from the tip to about the halfway point and a slow action rod bends from the tip of the rod back to about three quarters of its length. What makes these fast, medium, and slow is that bend. On a fast action rod, because only a fourth of the rod is flexing easily, it means that only a fourth of the rod has to spring back straight when pressure is taken off that rod. Therefore, it springs back pretty quick. Well, on the opposite side of the spectrum, that slow action rod, it's three quarters of the blank that's bending, and that means when pressure is taken off, that much more of that rod has to go through the process of discharging its energy and springing back to the straight position. So that means it springs back slower. So what the action is, is a description of how much of the rod blank actually bends under a basic level of pressure, which in turn affects how quickly that rod springs back straight. Well, the question then is, what should we use for what? What kind of action is most useful for what kind of application? Well, first of all, a rod's action influences how it casts. All right, And a slow action rod, because it has so much of the rod blank that bends, it means that if we've got a weight on there and we get it back behind us, when we go to cast it, a lot of that rod is going to maintain its bend through a good portion of our casting motion, and then it's going to come up and snap straight and then overflex a little bit. And what that means is it's got a real strong catapult effect. This is really good for casting light baits and baits that have poor aerodynamics like cranks and jerks because that extra catapult effect is good for tossing that light bait out there. The other thing is that uh, a rod's action influences how sensitive the tip of the rod is, how easily it transmits vibration, how quickly it bends. And this translates into a slow rod being usually less sensitive than a fast rod. Okay? Now, another thing we have to think about when we're using a rod is that the action affects how quickly we can set the hook when we feel a fish bite. And therefore, when we look at all of these factors, a slower action will cast lighter baits well, but takes more time to set the hook. Because of course, when I pull, more of the rod will bend as a result of my pull. And that means more time to set the hook. All right. And so this is good for lures that have multiple treble hooks on it, you know, uh, and this is also good for when, you know, say for instance, you're using a bait that you're reeling in really fast on, on the surface or underwater or a bait that you're jerking because you don't have to worry about the speed of your hook set to catch that fish because that fish kind of catches itself when it hits that moving lure. So a slow action is good for casting light baits and baits with poor aerodynamics like cranks and jerks but usually it lacks sensitivity and it has a slower hook set. A faster action is better for throwing heavier your baits because you get a good sharp snap at the end of your cast and it tends toward fast hook sets. So it's good for lures with lone treble hooks and lures where you need to set the hook really fast like top waters and also jigs. Fast action also is the most responsive rod when doing jigging when you're spinning fishing. So fast action is good for casting heavy lures and baits. It's very good for bottom fishing, top water, spinners, soft jigs. It's usually sensitive and it allows fast hook sets. Now, both medium and fast rods are great for bottom fishing due to greater sensitivity and faster hook set. And medium action rods are very versatile because they're not as slow as a slow action and they're more sensitive than a slow action so you can kind of get a lot of a lot of the similar techniques out of a medium action rod that you could get out of a fast action rod but it's going to cast a light bait a little bit farther than a fast action rod and so on and so forth so this the reason i made this graphic is because that way if you guys want you can screenshot it and you can use this as a reference but here we go that is your information on action. So remember, if you're casting light baits or baits that have poor aerodynamics, 
you're good with a slow action rod but remember you're going to have a slower hook set and you're going to lack some sensitivity if on the other hand you're casting some heavy lures lures with good aerodynamics and uh, you need to set the hook fast well then fast action is your way to go but whenever you're not completely sure how you should proceed a medium action rod is a good choice All right, now that we have talked about action and some of its applications when fishing, we're now going to move on to the concept of power. Now, I know stiffness comes first, but the reason we're going to discuss power is because power and stiffness are not the same thing. And very commonly, if you go and you search on Google or someplace and you look up the power rating of a rod, they tell you, oh, well, the power is the stiffness of the rod, and that's not correct power and stiffness are two different things it at the at the best it's a misuse of terminology and at the worst it's just plain misinformation so first we're going to discuss power and again i've got a graphic here for you and if we look this is going to hopefully make it nice and clear for you now a rod's power is its lifting capacity the heavier or harder a rod is in its power the more weight that it can handle before it bends. Thus, the heavier the rod, the more you can muscle a fish, while ultralight and light rods make fighting a fish more of a matter of finesse than a matter of muscle. Now, in our illustration here, we have a heavy, medium heavy, medium light, and ultralight rod. Each one of these is illustrated as having the same exact amount of weight suspended from the end of the rod, and as a result, you can see the bend that's taking place in the rod. Now, the example that I'm using here is a fast action rod. If we look at heavy and we see how much of the heavy rod is bending, you'll see it's about the last fourth of the rod, and therefore it's a fast action rod, just so you, it, to help you guys orient to what I showed you in the information about action. So if this was a fast action rod and we were to step through these, you'll see that a heavy rod has a great deal of resistance to its bend and therefore if I haul hard on that rod, it's going to allow me to more directly apply pressure to the fish, like I say muscle that fish. Whereas way down on the other end, the ultralight rod, the majority of that rod is taking a full parabolic bend, and that means that the harder I pull, the more that rod bends, the less power I can directly apply to that fish, and thus I'd have to be much more of a, a finesse fisherman to land a similar weight of fish with that ultralight rod. Now, when we're dealing with rods, when we're looking at the power of a rod, just kind of attune your line to whatever the power of the rod is. So a heavy line for a heavy rod, a light line for a light rod, because a heavy power rod should use heavy line because a light line might break before it flexes the rod, and a light rod should use light line because a heavy line might overwhelm that rod and break it. All right. Now, as I said, many internet sources will state that the power of a rod is its stiffness, but this is at best a poor use of terms and at worst your misinformation because stiffness or modulus is another category all of its own. Alrighty, so here I've got another graphic, and this talks about rod modulus. Now the stiffness of a rod material is properly called the modulus of that material. And a high modulus material is able to achieve greater amounts of stiffness with a lesser weight of material. Now the advantage to this is that rod makers can use modern materials like graphite and carbon fiber to create a stiff blank that weighs much less than traditional materials like fiberglass. All right. This reduces the thickness of the rod blank's walls, thus allowing it to more easily transmit vibration. This results in a lightweight yet sensitive rod. Further, 
If the rod maker wishes to sacrifice sensitivity, they can make the walls of the blank thicker. This creates a super stout rod capable of handling powerful fish like monster carp or large saltwater species. Now, you'll see here that I've demonstrated two cross sections, cross section of a high modulus blank, and then a cross section of a low modulus blank of equal stiffness. And you can see that though they're the same diameter, the walls of the high modulus blank are much thinner and therefore less weight than that low modulus blank. Now, um, for some of you older guys like me who remember when high modulus materials first started to appear, one of the problems that we had back then was that these high modulus materials were incredibly brittle. And so you'd go and you'd drop big money on this high modulus rod that was supposed to be the do-all, end-all of, of the brand new modern fishing rod and take it on out there. And the first thing you do is end up breaking the darn thing. But while early high modulus rods were brittle, current materials have overcome the problem of strain rate completely. And as a result, the modern generation of high modulus rods are durable and incredibly responsive because that's the other thing to understand is that a high modulus rod will usually be a very responsive rod. The stiffer a rod is, the more responsive it is because the more easily it stores energy and the more easily it releases energy back out. Therefore, we get high sensitivity due to the thin walls of the high modulus material, a great deal of responsiveness due to its wonderful stiffness. And then on top of that, um, you can, can turn around and get a high modulus material that's using thick walls and have an incredibly powerful rod at the weight of what used to be a relatively light rod. So overall, high modulus materials are a big winner. Now, when you are in the uh, descriptions of the rods in the game, what you'll note is that that stiffness rating, which is a number of between 1 and 10 of 10, that the number there will correspond to the description of what kind of material is being used in the rod. So you'll note that if it's like a, a 6 of 10 or a 5 of 10, it'll talk about a medium modulus material. Or if it's like 8 of 10 or 9 of 10, it'll be a high modulus material. And so as a result, it's an easy way to see very clearly that this stiffness and modulus are the same thing. All right, so now that we've gotten all those things sorted out, type sensitivity action, stiffness and power, we're gonna talk about test. What the test is, is it is the recommended weight range for the terminal tackle on your rod. What is your terminal tackle? Well, basically that's everything that's on the end of the line. That's your hook or lure, your bait, your sinkers, your float, your leader, any gear that's attached to the line once it leaves the rod. Now, when we're dealing with test, the lower end and the higher end both have a significant cutoff point for a reason. In this particular case, the test of this rod is 18 grams to 40 grams. Now, if I put less than 18 grams of weight on this rod and I try to cast it, my casting is going to be all over the place and frankly, um, it's not going to activate the responsiveness, the springiness of this rod because it's not going to be enough weight to create the effect of a small or greater amount of flexation in the end of that rod thus assisting the catapult weave effect we need to help cast that cast out there a good long time and so you're going to end up casting short on the other hand on the other end 40 grams if we go over 40 grams not only again is our casting going to be all over the place but that 40 grams is going to hyperflex that rod, which is going to throw off our casting. And there's even a possibility that it could generate enough torque on the whip to be able to snap that rod. So you want to keep your total test in between that 18 and 40 grams to get the most performance out of your rod. And frankly, the middle point of that is absolutely ideal. So if we just round this up and call it 20 to 40, well, that means that about 30 grams is going to give you really good casting control and casting distance. And 
function really well for you. All right. Then we have the length of the rod, 2.1 meters, and we have its load capacity. Now the load capacity is incredibly important because that is how much stress in weight that this rod can take before it's likely to collapse that tube that the rod blank is in the shape of and cause the rod to break. All right. So this rod has a load capacity of 11.5 kilograms and that means that we should not run line on here that's much greater than 11.5 kilograms in, in its strength. And we also should not put a reel on here that has a maximum drag that is greater than 11.5 kilograms. Okay, And we will be talking about how to create a balanced rod setup in an upcoming video. We then have the weight, which is just the overall weight of the rod. And being that this is made out of a high modulus material, it's pretty light rod at 214 grams. All right. You'll notice that it requires player level 7 and that you have to have the ability to fish with spinning rods in order to use it. But let's, let's just take a look here at the uh, description. The Heavy is a series of inexpensive and reliable long spinning rods. All heavy spinning rods are made out of high modulus graphite and equipped with RCSS guides by Tun Lao. Being powerful and having a high factor of safety, these rods are capable of dealing with the most serious underwater predators and have gained a vast popularity among anglers. Heavy spinning rods are perfectly suited for both casting and trolling. These are reliable rods for a reasonable price. So you'll remember that when we talked about modulus, I noted the fact that generally in the descriptions, the description of the modulus of the rod material will match up with the stiffness rating. So here you can see a stiffness rating of 8 of 10, and in the description it says that we have high modulus graphite as the material the rod is built with. Okay. Now, when it talks about uh, RCSS guides, the guides, the rings that the line passes through, if they're good quality, will be lined with a material that reduces the friction, wear, tear, and stress on the line as it passes through the rings because, of course, friction creates wear. It's always good to try to have a rod that has a fair number of eyelets on it. This one has one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, with this being a six-foot long rod, that means that that's a fair number of eyelets for a six foot long rod. If this is a 12 foot long rod, that would not be a good thing because the fewer the number of eyelets on a rod, the greater high stress it puts on certain points along the rod. All right, so more eyelets are better because what it does is it distributes the stress arc across the rod and therefore reduces your chance of breaking. Now, we will be doing a video here in the very near future about setting up a balanced setup, but today I just wanted to address fishing rods and what these various factors mean in their descriptions and some of the applications and what we would use different kinds of rods for in terms of their their action and power and so on. So thank you for joining me, Kachi aka Delakaba, for this and another Russian Fishing 4 video. I shall see you guys in the next one. And until then, remember, if you're gonna be a bear, be a grizzly. Sasquatch, Sasquatch, knocking on the trees, chucking rocks and screaming like a troop of chimpanzees. Sasquatch, Sasquatch, running around my place, are you the missing link or are you from outer space?